Hello guys, welcome to the first ever virtual DEF CON event. Uh, this workshop, Introduction to Wi-Fi Security, is a part of a Wireless Village, uh, you know, which is a part of DEF CON, as you know. Uh, so in this workshop, we are going to talk about the basics of Wi-Fi security. We will talk about the schemes uh, that Wi-Fi uses to keep your traffic, uh, your identity secure uh, while you are using the Wi-Fi. And we will also look at the ways to attack those. Uh, my name is Nishant and I will be conducting this workshop along with my colleague, Jaswin. Uh, we both work for Pentester Academy. So before moving forward, a uh, little bit background about us. Uh, I work as R&D manager at uh, Pentester Academy. Uh, we work on developing labs and training contents for our customers. Uh, when we are not doing that, uh, you know, we train uh, around the world in different different venues. Uh, we present our research. Uh, Jaswin uh, also works at Pentester Academy. Uh, he's a researcher there. And, uh, you know, apart from doing all the lab work and the routine work, uh, he also helps me as a co-trainer uh, in the trainings. And, you know, he also publishes his uh, research. Uh, so here are some cool logos from some conferences that uh, we have been to. Uh, this is the pentesteracademy.com. Uh, we have a lot of courses, uh, on-demand video courses on here. Uh, you can go and take a look. Similarly, we have a browser-based lab, which is completely in cloud. We call it Attack Defense. Uh, everything in this lab uh, can be used using your browser. You don't need any VPN. You don't need any plugin. Uh, we have customers from over 90 plus countries. And now coming to the workshop outline. So as discussed before, uh, we will talk about the basics of Wi-Fi. And then we will talk about sniffing and recon. We'll talk about WEP, WPA2 PSK, and WPA2 Enterprise, uh, what they are, how the authentication works in them, and uh, how we can actually attack them. So first of all, uh, you know, when you will read about Wi-Fi, you will see that it is referred by the name or this number uh, that's 802.11. So 802 is the committee that uh, deals with the network related norms and dot 11 is assigned to Wi-Fi or wireless LAN. So 802.11 is the standard and then there are multiple amendments to the standard to support newer things. So for example, uh, you have your 802.11 A, B, G, N, right? Similarly, you have I, W uh, and there is a list. There is a list of this. So all of these are amendments uh, to the main standard. Wi-Fi Alliance is the organization uh, that actually holds the right uh, for this specific uh, uh, logo. You know, the Wi-Fi trademarks actually belong to them. So if you are a vendor and uh, if you want to use this logo on your product, you have to take approval from them. So you submit your product to them and then, you know, they go through it, they check if it comply with, uh, you know, whatever standards they have and then you are allowed to use this logo. So, uh, uh, so there are multiple amendments uh, and, you know, uh, but we are only going to talk about those which deal with the, the transmission of Wi-Fi, okay. Uh, especially the bands and the, you know, the, the bandwidth and all. So in that uh, you have A, B, G, N and AC, which is the uh, latest one. So 802.11a, uh, it uses OFDM. So all of this, uh, you know, because it's a basic class, we don't have that much of time. But just to give you an overview, uh, there's a reason why these slides are here so that you can go back later. And, uh, you know, if you are interested in this specific part, you can dig deeper into it. So 11A is the first one. It was uh, the basic one. Uh, it used to use 5 gigahertz. And uh, at that time, OFDM was the way uh, to propagate the wave uh, of the data in this, this case. And uh, then the 11B came, it, it used to work on a different way of modulation and uh, 2.4 gigahertz was used for it. Then came the G. Uh, in G, they increased uh, the data carrying capacity. After that came N and actually allowed you to use two or more channels together. So it's, you know, uh, so what the idea here is to increase the throughput. 
so uh, you know from a b g n what we are trying to do we are trying to transmit more data uh, using wi-fi right because you know uh, it's not like the older times now uh, if you talk about 10 15 years back you don't you didn't had that kind of requirements as well as that kind of equipment at your home uh, so for example uh, you didn't have 4k tv right but now when you have 4k tv which uh, connects to your internet and you want to stream uh, you know a movie or something you need higher bandwidth right so that's where all of these standards actually came in so you know 11ac is the the latest one which is you know uh, being adopted by the market uh, for for uh, past few years now so it can actually give you up to 1.3 gbps of data transmission uh, using your home wi-fi so and if you talk about enterprise wi-fi then the limit will you know it will increase so these standards will make sure that you know it can accommodate your needs with the time so this is the 2.4 gigahertz channel uh, so wi-fi if we talk about the main wi-fi not not the newer ones like 11 ad or something uh, it operates on two main channels first one is the 2.4 gigahertz channel and the second one is the 5 gigahertz channel so this is the layout for the channels on 2.4 gigahertz so you can see that uh, there are 14 channels and all of these cannot be used in all of geographies uh, you know there are regulations uh, so according to them you can use 14 channels in some of the geographics of some of the nations and then you can use 12 or 13 in others right so you can refer to the regulatory uh, uh, information for this now what you can observe here is uh, these bands are very narrow and they overlap and this causes a lot of uh, problem because you know then you have interference when you have a lot of uh, you know wi-fi uh, networks operating and there are a lot of clients in the vicinity it is going to cause problem so that's where uh, people then move to 5 gigahertz so 5 gigahertz is more spread out it has non overlapping channels so you can transmit more right so that was the idea behind it now coming back to the sniffing and the connection part obviously if you want to connect to a wi-fi uh, everyone is doing it now so you know it's it's the part of daily routine now so you have your access point in your home at your office and then you have uh, a wi-fi card which you have connected to your desktop externally or you know you can have uh, a laptop which automatically comes with it your phones it have all of these have internal wi-fi cards so uh, you know also they have antennas so using that your device connects to the access point and then you are able to exchange traffic with it right so that's the basic thing about it now uh, when in normal mode these cards they don't actually look at the traffic of other cards so you know if you are sitting somewhere and uh, there are multiple clients and multiple uh, routers or access points as you like to call them uh, if there are multiple of these pairs they are transmitting data back and forth right so but the card that your machine is using uh, in normal operation it will only consider or it will only show you the traffic that is uh, you know that is for your machine uh, all the other it uh, it uh, you know it totally rejects that it totally ignores that so if you want to take a look at other people's traffic uh, it can't be done in the normal mode so for that uh, you have something called as monitor mode uh, if you guys have done a sniffing of other people's machine on lan uh, it's also known as promiscuous mode there so monitor mode allows you to look at the traffic in the vicinity so you know you can do sniffing and then you can go for attacks and all of those things so first of the things that you need is a wi-fi card which allow you to sniff which which actually allow you to put it into monitor mode so here are some of the cards which actually allows you know monitor mode you can order one from amazon or uh, some other uh, you know e-commerce e e market so this was the old way of doing it it was the conventional way of doing it now suppose you are dealing with something advanced right uh, you know you are dealing with 11 ac points uh, which is transmitting data on a very higher pace at that point what you can do is you can go for the, an off shelf access point 
uh, you can write uh, you know it with your own firmware and then you can use it for sniffing the the reason for doing that is for high performance access points uh, your cards will not be able to match the throughput or the capacity of those uh, you know access points so if you have an access point you have a better chance to not miss the traffic that is being transmitted or received by that specific access point now uh, you know because firmware is not something that uh, you know that is like windows software it's not like you download it and you click run and it runs and installs it's not like that and that's where a lot of people face problems so when you buy a router uh, you know of, of the shelf routers from market and you want to transform it into sniffer uh, you can use something like openwrt so openwrt is a linux based project for these embedded devices uh, which actually allow you to customize and uh, you know customize your routers and access points you can use it in access point mode you can make it something else you can make it a hacking gadget so all of that it actually allows you it has support for most of the hacking uh, and recon tools uh, especially for wi-fi and all so you can use it if you want to go for the higher throughput ones so now let's talk about some basic terminology that will help us uh, you know in, in in the workshop or the later parts of workshop so first station or sta in short is nothing but a wireless client it can be your mobile it can be your laptop it can be a desktop uh, you know with a wi-fi card on it then comes bss bss stands for basic service set so BSS, when you will hear about it, uh, it is to refer a set of access point and a client, if you know they are operating in that, or it can be ad hoc clients which you know do not need access point to connect. ESS is a set which contains multiple BSS, and similarly, then ESSID or SSID is the name uh, which we use to identify that ESS. So suppose you have a Wi-Fi network, uh, you put some name on it, right? Uh, home Wi-Fi or something. So that is SSID, right? It's, it's important to remember. That's why, you know, I'm explaining it again. SSID is the name of the Wi-Fi network that you are using, okay? And now BSSID refers to the MAC address of the access point that is giving you the Wi-Fi, right? So... BSSID will be the MAC address and you will be able to see it when you connect uh, with that Wi-Fi, uh, not in your Windows machine, you know, directly. Uh, you have to do some dig through or you have to look at the packets to see it. Then comes the distribution system. So generally distribution system refers to the network which connects access point with the larger network. So again, some examples of BSS. You can see that uh, in the first picture here, you have a BSS ID, uh, of, you know, this, this, this AP, you have this access point, and then there are uh, two nodes which will be connected to this. Similarly, in ad hoc uh, configuration, you can see that there is no access point, uh, but, you know, these, these machines are uh, connecting with each other. ESS is... It consists of DS, which is connecting to access points, and then it can uh, it consists of two BSS also, two or more actually, uh, two in this figure. Now coming to WDS. WDS is a wireless distribution system, right? So suppose uh, you want to deploy an access point in such a location where you don't have a wire, right? You don't have an Ethernet connectivity there. So what you can do is you can use access point which has wired connectivity to extend the network and this bridge uh, or this link between these two access points uh, is known as WDS link and then you can cover more ground. So uh, It's also known as uh, mesh networking uh, in Wi-Fi if you read about it. So now there are three main type of packets in uh, Wi-Fi. First is uh, the management packet Management packets uh, are used to, uh, to, you know, to, to connect, to disconnect, or to manage the devices, you know, if you want to say on board. Uh, similarly, control packets are something which deal with the, the transmission control and other thing 
but uh, that is not something that we are going to you know, look into uh, a lot. Uh, and the third one, data, uh, as the name suggests, these are the packets which will actually carry the real data. And then you have different subtypes in these. Uh, you can read about these. This, this table is available you know, on the internet. Uh, you can see that there are multiple management packets. Uh, you have association request, uh, association, response, uh, and similarly you have beacons and probes and whatnot, right? Uh, so to summarize the Wi-Fi environment, you have an access point which is currently operating uh, a Wi-Fi network, uh, which will be identified by its, its SSID. That's the Wi-Fi network name, right? Uh, and then BSSID will be there uh, because the MAC address needs to be there on the access point. And this SSID uh, will then send the beacons out. So beacons are the packets which uh, your access point uses to advertise that, uh, hey, I'm using or, you know, I'm, I'm providing you the specific Wi-Fi that you can use. Uh, if a, a client has already connected to this Wi-Fi, instead of waiting for a beacon frame, it can also do probing. So by probing, it sends a probe message looking for that specific network, which it already connected to once, you know, or multiple times in the in, you know, past. So once your client, it discovers uh, the Wi-Fi network, uh, then it goes ahead, it exchanges some packets with the access point and then it connects with the access point and, uh, you know, after that you can transmit data, you can access internet and uh, other things. So now, because, you know, uh, it was not the wired thing, it's, it's wireless, right? Uh, your packets are open, anyone with the monitor mode uh, interfaces can capture it and then, you know, can look into what you are doing if it is not encrypted. So that's the reason why uh, we needed Wi-Fi encryption standards so that we can protect our data from being sniffed by other people, right? Uh, at your home, it might not matter, but you know, especially if you are at a, at a coffee shop, if you are at, a, at your office, if you are at an airport, uh, all of this matters, right? So uh, here are some of the standards that we are going to talk about. Uh, we are going to talk about WEP. That was the oldest standard. Uh, uh, I hope that no one is using it now, uh, but still, you know, you will find it somewhere uh, in a CTF or in, in someone's home who is not very tech savvy or, you know, old. Uh, WPA, WPA2 uh, are the ones that are currently used. Uh, these can be used in two different configurations. One is the PSK or pre-shared key. It's also known as uh, WPA or WPA2 personal because it is meant to be personal use. And then there is enterprise one, which is meant for enterprise use. WPA3 is the latest standard. Uh, uh, it is something that you will see uh, in mainstream, uh, you know, within a year or, or maybe you know, this year. In some places, you might have already been started seeing this. So now to do the recon and the cracking uh, for WEP and WPA, uh, PSK, we are going to use AirCrack NG suite of tools. So it's a set of tool which allows you to do different things. So AeroDump NG and AirMon NG will allow you to capture the traffic, you know, to monitor the waves, to see the devices, access points that are in, that are in the vicinity. Uh, Airbase NG and Air Replay NG allows you to create a honeypot to send the authentication messages, to replay the messages, and uh, similarly, if you want to crack the key or the passphrase for WEP or WPA PSK, you use Aircrack NG. So you can know more about these by searching about these on Google. Uh, this tool is used a lot, so you'll find multiple videos on it. So now we'll talk about how to do basic recon with Airmon uh, and Aerodump, right? So now it's the demo time. And uh, for that, we will shift to our, uh, you know, demo setup. So this is the portal that we are going to use to, to learn about these attacks. Uh, the URL is blur. As of now, uh, don't worry about it. I will post the link to it in the... YouTube uh, part, in the YouTube description part. 
So if you go down, you will see that uh, we have a course here which says Wi-Fi Basics Workshop. You press start on it. It will show you four different scenarios. First is the Wi-Fi Basics, and then you have Attacking WEP, you have Attacking WPA2 Enterprise, and PSK. So we are going to start the Wi-Fi Basics one. So we chose this interface uh, because, you know, you can, as you can automatically see, uh, you have commands on this side, you have lab on this side. So it will help you to learn because, you know, you are the beginner people. So it really helps if you have guidelines ready instead of searching on it on a blog and then coming back and then pasting and making mistake and going back. Right. That actually wastes a lot of time. So what we will do now, we will select a server from here. In your case, you might only see one option. Uh, solve this recapture. And then you start the lab. It will take some time in starting the lab, so please be patient. So the lab is ready now. What we have to do is on the left hand panel, we will read about the steps. So first is check Wi-Fi interfaces present on this system. And then to fire this, we will use this button. Uh, please use Firefox for this exercise. It might feel, uh, you know, it might face some issues on uh, Chrome and others. So if you click this, the command will execute and you will see that we have a WLAN zero interface which is in managed mode, right? So as we discussed before, managed mode is good for normal operation, but if you want to do the recon and the, you know, the sniffing and other things, uh, this won't be enough, right? So you have to put it in monitor mode. And that's what we are doing in step two. So this is the command to put it in the monitor mode. As you can observe, IW dev WLAN zero, the name of the interface, and then set monitor none. So I'll press this, and it seems that uh, the command has run. Now let's again run this command to see if it is in monitor mode. Yes, it is. So we are ready now. So now what we will do, we will run aero dump uh, ng on WLAN zero. And we will not define any other options for now. We will let it, uh, you know, jump on all the channels of 2.4 gigahertz and find what it can. So press this. And as you can observe here, now it is looking for different, different ESSIDs or SSIDs. You can also see the corresponding BSSIDs, corresponding channels, and you can also see some of the stations uh, you know, which means these are laptops or uh, these can be phones. In this case, uh, this is emulated lab, so obviously these are none. But in realistic scenario, you will see the phones, the, the laptops, other machines, uh, you know, sending probe requests looking for these specific Wi-Fi. Right? So this is how you can check which devices are in the vicinity. So do it. Control C to stop it. And then let's move to the next screen here. Now suppose I'm only interested in looking at uh, traffic of channel one. So in that case, I can fire this command. And here with argument dash C, I have defined the channel number. So what you will see here is this time, this channel will not jump. And you will only see the traffic which is coming on that, this specific channel, right? So uh, this is how you use AeroDump to do basic recon. And with this, our lab is done. You can stop the lab after this and we'll get back to the slides. So now I will pass it over to my colleague, Jaswin, who will go through the WEP part and, uh, you know, then I'll meet you guys again uh, when we will discuss WPA2 PSK and WPA2 Enterprise. Hello, everyone. Next, we'll take a look at web, wired equivalent privacy. When it comes to wired network, 
the physical proximity itself acts as a security mechanism. That is, we need to get into the building physically, find a port, plug in our device, and sniff the traffic or perform an attack. Whereas in case of wireless networks, we have radio waves which are not bound by walls. Therefore, it is very easy to intercept the traffic. Web was the original IEEE standard to add security to wireless network. It provided security equivalent to that of wired network and hence the name. Web used RC4 stream cipher for generating the key stream. It supported 40 bit shared key, which is equivalent to 5 ASCII characters or 10 hexadecimal characters, and a 104 bit shared key, which is equivalent to 13 ASCII characters or 26 hex characters. Now, if the same key is used to encrypt multiple plain text messages, what the attacker can do is analyze the cipher text to the multi pattern, and the attacker can ultimately find the key. To prevent this, an initialization vector is added to the key. In case of web, the initialization vector had length of 24 bit. Therefore, the encryption key had the length of 64 bit or 128 bit. Web used CRC32 for generating the integrated check value. Now let's take a look at the encryption process. So here we have the initialization vector, key, and the message. The initialization vector and key is passed to the key scheduling algorithm and the pseudo random number generator. It generates the key stream which will be used to encrypt the data. On the second part, we have the message. The integrity check value is generated of the message and is concatenated with the message and then it is encrypted. The integrity check value is generated so that after decryption, we can verify that the message has not been tampered with. So finally, the message and the ICV is XOR with the key stream to generate the ciphertext. In the end, the packet has initialization vector, 2-bit key ID, ciphertext, and ICV. Now let's take a look at the decryption process. In the decryption process, we have initialization vector, 2-bit key ID, ciphertext, and ICV. We'll get the key from the key ID and we'll feed it to the key scheduling algorithm along with the initialization vector. This is further passed to the pseudo random number generator and the key stream is generated which will be used to decrypt the ciphertext. The ciphertext is XOR with the key stream to generate the message and the ICV. Now the ICVs are compared and if both of them match, the packet is considered, otherwise it is discarded. Now the next question arises, what was the weakness of web? The major weakness in web was the length of the initialization vector. 24 bit was not enough. And as a result, when we have large number of packets, the IV will get repeated. And once the attacker has all of these ciphertext with repeated IVs, the attacker can easily find out the shared key. Now the attacker has two options. One is to wait and sniff all the traffic till we get enough number of IVs or the attacker can inject a packet to force the access point to send more packet and therefore the attacker will get more number of IVs. And this way the second option fastened the process and made it possible to crack any web key. Now to crack a 64-bit web key usually 250,000 IVs are required and to crack 128-bit web key, 1.5 million IVs are required. But with the techniques such as PTW, it is possible to crack web keys with a very less number of IVs. So to crack web keys, there are many methods. Few of the methods are fake authentication, capillate attack, chop chop attack, fragmentation attack and PTW attack. Now, in order to crack the web key, we'll start by sniffing the traffic, identify the SSID, BSSID, and the channel. Now, in order to send packets to the access point, the MAC address of the attacker has to be authenticated with the access point. Otherwise, any packet we send will get blocked and we'll get the authentication. Now, in order to authenticate the MAC address, fake authentication can be used. 
So what happens through fake authentication is we tell the access point that we can prove that we have the shared key, but we will not send the shared key yet. This way, the access point will add the MAC address of the attacker to the list of clients who can send packets to the access point. Now, since we have not sent the shared key to the access point, we cannot transmit data. However, we can capture the data from the legitimate client connected to the network and then replay those packets. Now, this is exactly what we are going to do. First, we'll capture the ARP request sent by already connected client and then we will replay it to the access point. So, when the access point gets the ARP request, it will rebroadcast the ARP request with a new initialization vector. This way, we can continuously send ARP requests to the access point to get more and more ARP requests with new initialization vector. Once we have enough number of initialization vector, we can use error track ng to track the web key. So now let's take a look at them. So we'll quickly select the server and we'll solve the captcha. Then we'll start the lab. It should take a couple of seconds for the lab to come up. The lab is now ready. So let's increase the size of the font. We'll start testing the interfaces on the machine. So we have two interfaces. One is WLAN 1, another is WLAN 4. Both are in managed mode. So we'll set WLAN 0 into monitor mode. And we'll check the list of interfaces again. So now you can see WLAN 0 is in monitor. Now let's check the networks which are present in the vicinity. We can do this with the help of aero dump ng command. So now as you can see, we have Epic Media Corp, which is using web on channel 6. So next, what we will do is we'll start a capture in channel 6 and write those packets into capture file. Now, if we just keep sniffing, it could take a lot of time to get enough number of packets. So what we are going to do is, Yes, we will start an other replay attack in order to generate more number of packets. So we'll start an R replay attack. And now we need around 10,000 data packets. For currently, you can see we have 83, 132, and the number increased. So now we have 10,000 data packets. We'll stop the capture. And we'll also stop attacking uh, the access point. Now we'll use airbrack ng command to track the web key. We'll have to mention which network we want to target. In this case, we have Epic Media Network, which is having the index of 4. So the end of 4 now. And then we'll start tracking. So we were able to find the key. The key was 14332. So guys, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the WEP uh, you know, session. So now we will talk about WPA2 PSK. Uh, this is the scheme that is widely used. You'll find this at your home and even in the smaller you know, coffee shops and or the restaurants or even the small offices. So WPA2 came after WPA. WPA was a transitional scheme uh, to move from WEP to WPA2. So WPA2 uses dynamic keys, unlike WEP. It uses AES encryption standard uh, with CCMP mode, in the CCMP mode. And uh, the protocol is still secure. Uh, it is prone to passphrase brute forcing or, or the dictionary attacks if your password is not strong. But apart from that, uh, the scheme is still secure. Uh, there were crack attacks that were you know, discovered last year, uh, which was for this specific uh, scheme. But again, it is very important to understand that uh, the problem was not in the scheme itself. It was in the implementation. So the scheme, theoretically, if you choose a good, strong password, it is good to go. Uh, but WPA2 also had its own uh, shortcomings. Uh, it, it doesn't have forward secrecy, so which means 
if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm capturing all of your traffic today, and if you're using WPA2 uh, PSK, even if I don't have the password today, if I somehow manage to get the password, you know, two months after or two, two years after, I can still go back and decrypt all of your traffic. So that is not good from security uh, point of view. Similarly, there is no management frame protection. So uh, your receiver, when he receives a management frame, he doesn't have any way to tell that, you know, if it is coming from a real source of it, or it is, you know, something which is sent by a attacker or a malicious user. And that's the reason why the deauthentication attacks, which are used widely for Wi-Fi DOS, the denial of service, uh, work, right? So you can read about deauthentication attacks. It's, it's very common now. It's being used for quite some years now. And also WPA2 PSK or personal is uh, supposed to be personal, right? It is supposed to be used in a personal network. So if you use it in a work environment or somewhere which you will, or some place which you don't count as a personal space, uh, it is also prone to insiders, right? So if you have a malicious insider, he can actually see the traffic of all the people on that specific Wi-Fi. So, as we mentioned before, uh, there are no static keys like WEP. So, idea is you generate a dynamic key, you use that to decrypt the traffic or encrypt the traffic, and then, you know, next time when you do this, uh, you again generate the keys again. In saying it's very easy, but, uh, you know, there, you need some way in which both the parties can have the keys and then you, they can use them to encrypt and decrypt stuff. And obviously this key needs to be the same, right? Because we are going to use the symmetric encryption. It's a lot of data. So what we do in this case is we use something called PSK. That's where the PSK terms come. It's pre-shared key. So you have a passphrase, uh, which is you know between eight to 63 uh, letters long or characters long. And uh, you use it, you feed it to PBKDF2. PBKDF2 is a function. It stands for Password Based Key Derivation Function. And it will actually give you a pre-shared key of 256 bit. The reason of doing this is passphrases are easier for human beings. Just like you have IP to domain mappings, similarly you can use passphrase to generate the pre-shared key. It's easier to remember something meaningful than, uh, you know, than a chunk of uh, random hex characters. So when your access point is configured, it already knows the passphrase. When you connect to that network, you also knows the, know the passphrase. And that's how it works. So both the parties, they can calculate the same PSK and then uh, they can use it for uh, connection. But again, uh, as you can observe, PSK is not transient or not temporary in nature, right? It's not dynamically generated, okay? You are converting it from the passphrase to the PSK, but uh, that's not dynamic nature, right? Uh, it will remain same till the time you will not change the password, right? So that's where uh, we have to generate something else, which we refer to PTK uh, from this. So PMK is derived using this specific function here. You use PBKDF, you pass it the secret passphrase, you pass it the SSID name, and then the SSID name length, and then these numbers are there, uh, which is 4096, it's the number of iteration that will happen. And then 256 is the intended key length for the PMK key that we are going to get. So you can read more about uh, BBKDF and all of this in RFC 2898. So what will happen in WPA2 or even in WPA, we have this handshake. We call it four-way handshake. And this handshake is used to generate this specific you know, temporary key that you use to, to pass the traffic on securely, right, obviously. Uh, so when your client, it wants to connect to the access point, uh, first of all, you know, it will locate the access point, it will locate the, the Wi-Fi network. And after that, you know, there are authentication and association messages, uh, which are part of Wi-Fi protocol. Uh, but here, please don't confuse authentication with the thing that we are going to do now. So it's more uh, of, uh, you know, compatibility kind of thing rather than security. 
So first four steps are you know pretty much same. Uh, your client it will ask the AP that hey I want to connect and your AP will say okay go ahead. So this much is done. After this both of them have pre-shared key. Why? Because both of them had passphrases right and when you have passphrases you can derive PSK of 256 bit from it. We just saw it in the previous slides. Now your access point will send message one. It's the first message. There are four messages. That's why it is four way handshake. So in first message, it will generate a random number or a random string. Uh, it will call it a nonce and it will send it in a packet in plain text to the supplicant. Supplicant here is the client, uh, your mobile laptop, you know, whatever it is. Now what your client will do it will take these a nonce and it will also generate a random number or random string called s nonce. So a here denotes to the authenticator or the access point. S here denotes to the supplicant or, or this station. So when you have s nonce and a nonce which are randomly generated, you can use this specific function here to generate the PTK. PTK is the pairwise transient key and as you can observe here, we passed PM to it. PMK is nothing but a key that we derived using the passphrase and SSID and SSID name, uh, name length. And then you have A nonce and S nonce. These are randomly generated by access point and the client. And then you have access point MAC and the client MAC. So this is the information which is now used to generate a temporary key. This is temporary because a nonce and s nonce are randomly generated. So now this happens. So this guy can generate a PTK. Now what it will do, it will send s nonce plus MIC. MIC or Michael is used to verify the integrity of a message and it is signed by a key. So in this case, the key that we have used that we have generated is used to sign this message and again a nonce and s nonce are in plain text so it will be sent to the access point now access point has all the information so it will also generate ptk so what it will do it will generate its ptk it will check this mic and then it will generate mic for this specific packet and match the mic to mic now if this mic matches it means the ptk is same with the both parties. In that case, access point will go ahead, install the key for use, and it will also send a message to the client that you know this key is good, please go ahead with it. And then client will also say, okay, I have installed the key and now we can use this key for encrypting the traffic. And then the encryption starts. Now, if uh, suppose the access point, if it does not have the same PMK, you know, the, the passphrase is different for access point and uh, the client, then the PTK will be different because, you know, it depends on PMK, right? Then the MIC check will fail and in that case, access point will reject it and it will not connect. So this is how the authentication works in WPA uh, four-way handshake. So again, to reiterate, you have the PF passphrase. You use PBKDF, you put it, you gave it uh, SSID name, length, and you generated a pre-shared key. That is 256 bit in length. And then from four-way handshake, you get all of this information. You get S nonce, A nonce, because again, these are transmitted in plain text. There is no encryption. And then AP MAC and client MAC is something that you can easily see. And from there, you will generate the PTK. You will use the PTK to encrypt the traffic. So now from an attacker's angle, if you want to perform an attack, a dictionary attack on uh, to guess the PTK, how you will do it? You will take a dictionary. You will take one passphrase from dictionary at one time and you will generate the PTK because obviously you also need to have this information which will come from four way handshake. Once you have this, you can generate the PTK you have a packet from the real you know, access point or client which has MIC. You will generate the MAC, you will 
you know, you will generate the MIC and then you will compare the MIC. If MIC is correct, then, uh, you know, you have done it. You have got the right passphrase for it. So this is how the dictionary attack will work. Now look at the information what we need, right? So all packets will have AP and client MAC because, you know, one is sender, one is a receiver. Uh, a nonce is going in packet one and packet three. And S nonce is going in packet two. So now what you can do here is you can either take all four packets or you can either take packet one or two and you will have all the information that you need to crack WPA to PSK. And again, the authentication, we already talked about it. It's a packet that you sent, uh, you know, you, you spoof it. You send it to client from posing as, you know, access point. If you are sending it to access point, you will pose as, you know, one of the clients. And then you will tell the other party that, you know, I don't want to be connected to you anymore. So in that case, the other party will think that this message is being sent by the real party and, you know, it will disconnect. So this comes handy when you have an access point connected with a client and you want this to move so that you can capture the four-way handshake. Because remember, four-way handshake will only take place when you are connecting to the device first time. When you are connecting to the access point, only then your client will do the four-way handshake. If it's already connected, there is no need to do the four-way handshake. So if we want to capture four-way handshake for a, a device which is already connected, we have to do a day authentication. So now it's the demo time. We will do this using the same lab. Uh, the principles are very simple. WPA PSK is using a weak passphrase, which is present in our dictionary. We will capture the four way handshake and then we will attack it. So let's move to the lab. So let's go to attacking WPA to PSK. Again, you have to select a zone from here. Prove to this guy that you are not a robot, you are a human. And then start the lab and wait. And the lab is ready. We'll follow the same drill. First, let's check uh, the Wi-Fi interface. Uh, there is a Wi-Fi interface in managed mode uh, and its name is WLAN 0. We'll put it in monitor mode. Let's check if it is there. Yes, it is in monitor mode. Now let's run aero dump on WLAN 0. And here we can observe uh, that uh, this is the SSID protected network, which is using WPA2 PSK. So let's press Control C and uh, move to the next step. SSID protected network is the one that we want to do the attack on. So for that, what we want to do is we need to capture the four-way handshake, right? So it is running on channel four. So what we will do, we will run aero dump capture, uh, pack, packet capture on uh, channel four using this command. And as you can observe, it is now doing that. If we wait for some time, it will also find the client that is attached to this specific machine. If you are not able to see it, don't worry. We will do a broadcast deauthentication on this BSSID and then also it will work. But you know, as you can observe here, AeroDump has found one client that is this client connected to this BSSID, right? Now, if you remember to capture the four way handshake, we need to disconnect it, right? And for that, we are going to use the authentication packet. And so we can launch it from the next tab, open a new tab. You can use the same WLAN zero interface to do this because you know, you have set WLAN zero on channel four and you want to send this packet on channel four as well. So click on this. And you will see that a replay ng is sending deauthentication packets, 100 packets to this specific uh, BSSID. So let's do control C because I think uh, these are enough. And 
let's go back here and now what happened uh, when we did this is this guy here it was disconnected and then it reconnected once we stopped the deauthentication attack and when it did that we captured handshake for it so now we have handshake you can also you know run commands on it if you like to so you can observe that we have the file the capture file here we also have this specific dictionary here which we will use to crack it so now we can go ahead and try to crack it we'll use air crack ng with this dictionary and test dash 01.cap is the capture file so run it attack is running and we have found the right key so the right passphrase is raspberry so with that uh, this demo is done this is how easy it is to attack it if you are if you are using uh, you know a weak passphrase so after wpa2 psk now we will talk about wpa2 enterprise uh, we already you know learned about the shortcomings of wpa2 personal uh, these are not really shortcomings but uh, it was designed in such way it was designed for personal spaces uh, so it was assumed that whoever is using the network you don't need to hide you know your information from them so that's the reason why same password was there and uh, all the other people on the network had the capability to decrypt your traffic but if you want to use this for your enterprise or for your company uh, there is this this is going to be a problem right because uh, first thing is this insider threat and the second thing is it is difficult to maintain the credentials because everyone is using the same passphrase now suppose if this passphrase gets leaked uh, you have to change it you have to inform everybody and you have to keep doing this uh, again and again right uh, so for that uh, these people they came up with wpa2 enterprise so in wpa2 enterprise uh, instead of using a passphrase a radius server is used for authentication so this radius server will maintain the credential list for all the authorized users and then users can use their username passwords to authenticate with the wifi so it it looks like this so you have your uh, wifi a client that is you know a laptop or a pc and then you have the access point which is connected to the radius server so this radius server is the authentication backend here and then this is the handshake flow so four way handshake will be there because again it's a wpa uh, but in this case because there is no passphrase uh, eep will be used so eep is extended authentication protocol so eep will be used to do authentication with the authentication server that is the radius server in the backend so your client after doing the connection ritual it will uh, send a ea poll start which is the first packet and then access point will ask it for its identity so you know if you are using credentials uh, the username will be the identity and this username will be then uh, forwarded to the authentication server so after this the access point uh, you know will will be in the path but it's not really doing anything uh, your client and the authentication server will exchange some packets and once it is uh, proved to the authentication server that uh, this guy or this client is the real client it will generate a pmk uh, it's randomly generated and then it will send this pmk to the access point and to the client so you can observe the difference from the psk here it is not being generated from the passphrase that was known to both parties and after you know you have pmk on both the parties you will do the same four way handshake and then you know data transfer will continue now the scheme that we are going to talk about in in this demo is a peep ms chap v2 so peep stands for protected extensible authentication protocol it is uh, known as protected or it is being referred as protected because 
all the EAP packets that will be exchanged between your uh, client and your authentication server will go through a TLS tunnel. So even access point cannot look into it, right? What, what it is sending. And then uh, MS CHAP, uh, MS obviously stands for Microsoft. And then CHAP is Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol. So it's a challenge response authentication protocol where one party will send a challenge and then the other party will send response and then you know they'll verify each other. So it's like that. So uh, the user account credentials, the password and the username will be used. A TLS certificate will be used to create the tunnel and to make sure that the client is connecting to the correct authentication server. So this is how it looks. Uh, so till here, you can see that the request identity is asked by the radius server or the access point, and then the username is provided. After that, it requests for the PEEP. The radius server is initiating PEEP, and then a TLS tunnel will be set up. So this certificate will be sent by the authentication server to the client, and the client, if it accepts it, uh, after that, it will do the MS CHAP challenge. So the challenge will be sent by the radius server. Uh, your client is supposed to provide a response and send it to the radius server. The radius server will check it. If it is good, then EAP success will be conveyed and the PMK will be shared with the station. And on the same time, it will also share the PMK with the access point because uh, PTK is the, the key that will be generated by the station and the access point, right? So radius has nothing to do there. So now if you want to attack it, what are the ways? So what you can do is, uh, instead of making the client connect to the real access point, you can uh, you know create your own honeypot or fake access point or evil twin. And uh, when the client will connect to it, Obviously, because you don't have access to the real radius server, right? Because if you had that, you could have taken credentials from there, right? You don't have that. So what you will do, you will emulate a fake radius server, which will say yes to all the credentials, right? And then here you are relying on the client that it will provide you the real credentials. But before that, there is a problem with PEEP, right? Because uh, there is a TLS tunnel. And because the certificate that your fake uh, you know, access point or fake radius will send, it will not match the real certificate. So your client will actually get, uh, you know, a, a warning that uh, the certificate doesn't match or we don't know this certificate. So at that point, if your client or if your user, he accepts this fake uh, certificate or, or non-real certificate, then you are in a problem. If you don't do this, then, you know, you are again safe. So, you can say that uh, this attack is a combination of technical as well as social engineering angles, right? So we are going to do this attack, but uh, to keep it simple, what we will do instead of uh, creating an evil twin, we will create a honeypot. So you don't have to, you know, do the uh, do the deauth and all those all those things. So for that, we are going to use HostPD Mana Toolkit. Uh, so it's a tool which can be used to create the rogue access point. Uh, it is generally used uh, mainly for the enterprise networks because, you know, it will keep the hassle of creating a radius and all, you know, away from you. You can directly go, you can fire three, four commands and, you know, you are good to go. You are good to do attack. So uh, let's go for the demo now. So here, go for the attacking WPA2 enterprise. Same drill. You have to select the server. You have to prove that you are a human and you might have to solve this a recapture. So now the lab is ready. So let's see what interfaces are there on the lab. So here we can observe that there are two interfaces WLAN 0 and WLAN 1. Uh, let's put WLAN 0 into monitor mode and let's run your dump on it. So what we can observe here is uh, there's a client which is looking for amaze underscore LLC, right? So if we go to next step, we will see that uh, 
the challenges regarding this only a client is probing for a maze underscore llc uh, we have to create a honeypot uh, and then we have to steal the credential for it uh, and this guy is using peep ms chap v2 so let's do a control c here uh, we'll also need fake certificates as we talked about before and there you go we have provided you all the things that you need for this if you scroll down you will also see the configuration for uh, the host apd mana so what you have to do here is first you have to create this file so i'm using vim vim is mostly available in most environments so you can use that and let's copy this and paste it here and you have to format it you have to make sure that everything is in separate lines let me do that so now i have done the formatting for this file let's go over the configuration file so first is the interface uh, we are using wlan1 uh, ssid is mentioned we want to host a honeypot with amaze underscore llc uh, you can choose channel as per your liking uh, i have chosen six here hardware mode is uh, g which indicates the 11g and then wpa3 uh, means the wpa2 and here uh, we are using management tkeep here you can put ccmp you can put something else so yeah there's a mistake when you put tkeep ccmp which means you support both wpa and wpa2 psk and then uh, you know for 1x 1x is the the eep and you are also hosting a fake uh, backend server and uh, for that we will provide special configuration in this file which can be then used by our uh, host apd mana and here you can observe the certificate the key all of that is uh, provided so that when the tunnel forms uh, you know this setup can get the information and then show us uh, what it is mana eep success actually signifies that doesn't matter what kind of credentials the user provides we will always tell him that uh, these are the correct ones so this file is done let's create the second file let's move a little though and copy it from here paste it so to know more details about uh, you know these configurations i'll uh, suggest you visit hostpd mana's github page the link to the documentation is also given here so check that out you will be able to understand these better so this configuration will make sure that uh, doesn't matter what kind of uh, scheme or what kind of uh, method your eep is using it will support it even if it is a peep or a ttls or tls or even if it is using ms chap or gtc or something inside so all of that will be supported so it's a catch all kind of thing so once it is done we can move forward and we can launch this to start our honeypot so what we can observe here is on interface wlan1 we have created a maze underscore llc ssid here what we are observing is a client which was roaming has tried to connect to this uh, you know access point and in that process we are able to see the information that it was passing so if you remember we talked about chap right the challenge response so here uh, host apd mana is actually giving us the challenge the response so that we can crack it and the username here is shom so this is the command that uh, we need to use with asleep to crack it so if we move down we have actually written this command for you let's clear the screen a little bit and let's run this command 
So what we did here is because we had the challenge and the response captured, uh, we used a, a dictionary file that is given here. And from that, we recovered the password for it. The password is chocolate in this case. So this is how using a honeypot, you can attack enterprise uh, networks, the WPA2 enterprise in this case, which was using a PEEP MS Chap 2 uh, version 2. The attack will work similarly for the other schemes as well. So with this, uh, we are going to conclude this workshop. I hope you learned about the basics of Wi-Fi and the schemes and how to attack them. And if you face these in real world or in a CTF somewhere, you will be able to solve it. So with that, uh, thanks again for attending our workshop uh, in Wireless Village. We also, you know, thanks Wireless Village and the DEF CON team to make all of this possible in uh, this tough in, uh, time, uh, right? Uh, doesn't matter how bad it is, the learning should continue. And with that, uh, I'll say thanks. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, any comments, any feedbacks, uh, here's my email ID. Uh, you can drop me a mail and, uh, you know, I'll try to help you out. Thank you.